Well, hello everyone. Happy Halloween, or belated Halloween, depending on when I manage to upload this. <laughs> now, I wasn't planning on making this at all, really, but a few weeks ago, I was bedridden with a fever and just flicking through Netflix, as you do, and I came across this one. Bram Stoker's Dracula from 1992, directed by Francis Ford Coppola, starring legends such as Gary Oldman, Winona Ryder, Keanu Reeves, Anthony Hopkins. In other words, a very impressive cast. I had seen parts of this before, um, many years ago when it aired on TV, but I couldn't remember much, so I watched it. <laughs> And I am very glad I did. <laughs> Let me take you all on a ride this evening full of wonderful 90s period drama campiness. <laughs> it's just the best word I can use to describe it. But real quick before we start, if you want a thorough walkthrough of the original Dracula novel, which this is based on, I recommend checking out my video on that before starting this. It will be linked above and below. But yes, so why don't you make yourself comfy with a nice drink and a snack and let's get into it. The movie starts off with a dramatic backstory for our title character Dracula and he is revealed to be a knight of the sacred order of the dragon. He is kissing his beloved wife goodbye before going into battle. And we are then shown the battle in a kind of shadow silhouette, a rather stylistic choice if you ask me. <laughs> we see him impaling people left and right and we know that it's him thanks to his very unique armour. It has these huge pointy ears and the colour and design of it makes it kind of look like a flayed man. I don't like it, I think it's hideous. <laughs> So Dracula slays on the battlefield, literally, so his vengeful enemies sent message to his castle that he had died in battle. His wife Elisabetta then threw herself from a tower in grief. Dracula returns to find her body in the chapel and he's of course devastated. So his sassy priest feels compelled to tell him that she's damned now. Her soul cannot be saved, as she did this to herself. God doesn't like that. He really needed to rub it in, didn't he? <laughs> so Dracula flies into a rage. He's completely trashing the place, frightening the poor priests. I mean, all he did was tell him the truth. Why is he so angry? <laughs> So Dracula then renounces God, stabs the cross with his sword and blood starts spilling out from it, as though it was alive? <laughs> anyway, he drinks it, so he's a vampire now. And that's the end of the intro. Flash forward to London in 1897, so 400 years later, and we meet our hero, Jonathan Harker, as he is given the assignment to help this foreign fellow, Count Dracula, to buy some property in London. And we just have to get one thing out of the way. <laughs> Keanu Reeves. We all love him, he's a fine actor, but this is not his best performance. <laughs> you'll, you'll see. Keep watching. <laughs> So off he goes to his fiancée Mina to say goodbye before leaving for Transylvania. She had wished to marry him before he had to leave, but alas. We can be married when I return. And they share a passionate goodbye kiss that lasts just long enough to make me uncomfortable. But then we are finally on the train with Jonathan writing about his journey in his journal. Which is so far the first book accurate thing we've come across. I quite like the style they've gone for here, with the red sky and everything. Very much on theme, isn't it? We skip past some steps of the journey though, and Jonathan is now dropped off by a carriage, at night, in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> a woman who had also travelled in that carriage gives him a crucifix, which confuses him, but he accepts it nonetheless. 
Then the carriage drives off, leaving him alone in the dark. But not for long. Another carriage arrives, and it's the most suspicious looking thing you could ever imagine. <laughs> and Jonathan is surprisingly composed throughout all of this. The carriage even goes by a road mere inches from the side of a cliff, and Jonathan is like, oh well. Even as the carriage rides through a blue flame barrier, he's just, huh, would you look at that? His creepiness radar is just not working quite yet. Although I suppose that's rather book accurate. I didn't think of that. Hmm. But we have finally arrived at the castle and we meet Count Dracula in all of his glory. Or, well, almost. He's looking a little rundown, but at least he has a heart-shaped silhouette. He is a romantic deep down, after all. Also, couldn't they have given Gary Oldman a lamp with a shorter chain? It looks exhausting to hold it so high above your head. Jonathan is then treated to a lavish meal, just like in the book, and he tries to make some awkward conversation, asking questions about Dracula and his family history. But sadly, he ends up offending him, causing Dracula to growl and point his sword at him. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but Jonathan apologizes, so all is well and good. We then move forward with the business, and he helps Dracula with the paperwork for the purchase of 10 properties in various locations around London. This is when Dracula sees the pocket photograph that Jonathan had of his fiancée Nina, and Jonathan tells him that they will be married upon his return to London. We can be married when I return. He asks Dracula... Dracula? <laughs> um, he asks... asks Dracula. He asks Dracula whether he is married, and he says that he was, but she died long ago. He even sheds a few tears, but hides it from Jonathan. Gary Oldman really is perfect for this role. He can do the over-the-top shenanigans just as well as the subtle things, despite being covered in Dracula makeup. <laughs> he really is brilliant. This movie would not work as well as it does without him. Anyway, so Dracula then asks Jonathan to write letters to his employer and loved ones, saying that he will be staying there for a whole month, which Jonathan finds a bit odd. Meanwhile, back in England, Mina is staying with her wealthy friend Lucy Westenra, and she keeps a diary, just like Jonathan. And that, But then she takes a break from her writing to catch up on some sex education. You know, as one does. <laughs> But don't worry, she finds it disgustingly awful. Oh, disgustingly awful. But then Mina's friend Lucy enters and catches her reading the naughty book. More specifically, Arabian Nights, which I have to agree is surprisingly naughty. So they have a look at some of the pictures together, trying to figure out how intercourse worked. Which is honestly the most realistic thing in this whole film. <laughs> I remember when I was 14, I need my wine for the story. <clears throat> yes, when I was 14, I was at the local library and I came across Casanova's Memoirs. I was intrigued, so I had a look at it and it turned out that it was illustrated. So me and my friend ended up sitting under the table in the library, giggling as we were looking at these illustrations. We wouldn't dare have it open on the table just in case anyone would walk past and see what we were looking at. So yeah, I guess I can kind of relate. We then move on to a little party at Lucy's mansion, where we meet our three young gentlemen who are all interested in Lucy. Quincy the Texan, Jack the Doctor, and Arthur. Just Arthur. <laughs> and Lucy flirts with them all, or at least with Quincy and Arthur. Jack should just Treats like a child for some reason. <laughs> Oceans of love. Oh, Jack, my dog. Oh, poor little baby. Oh, my kitty, come over here. Come over here and I'll get to bed. My poor little blossom. My poor 
quality doctor. Brilliant doctor. Later, we get to see Dr. Jack at work. Also, he's not named Jack in the book. There he's John. No idea why they changed this, but anyway. He's working at an asylum where he's treating Mr. Renfield, a former colleague of Jonathan Harker, who had fallen into madness after his business trip to Transylvania. And he is indeed rather unwell, eating bugs and ranting about a master who will make him immortal. Also, the asylum looks more like a dungeon, to be honest. And the workers there have these odd cage-like helmets. I would have a full-on panic attack if I had to wear that. <laughs> Back in Transylvania, Jonathan has some unpleasant encounters with Dracula in his room. They've taken several different scenes and situations from the book and made it into a mishmash of a scene which just feels slightly off. But at least Dracula insults Jonathan's mirror. That's an important detail. <laughs> and we finally get some more animated reactions from Keanu Reeves. The creepiness radar has officially woken up. And immediately after the scene, we get one of the most iconic, legendary references from the book. The lizard fashion. This one, my friends, is worthy of the full quotes. I saw the fingers and toes grasp the corners of the stones, worn clear of the mortar by the stress of years, and by thus using every projection and inequality, move downwards with considerable speed, just like a lizard moves along a wall. 15th of May. Once more I have seen the Count go out in his lizard fashion. He moved downwards in a sidelong way, some hundred feet down, and a good deal to the left. Bram Stoker could never have guessed that the lizard fashion would become an eternal meme. I'm quite fond of it, I have to say. But honestly, look up Dracula Daily on Tumblr if you're interested. It's hilarious. <laughs> but regardless, Jonathan has had enough now and decides to go exploring the castle. And he finds a chamber where a seductive female voice calls for him and instructs him to lay down. Yes, you know where this is going. <laughs> so three half-naked ladies appear and start having some fun with Jonathan, but I won't show any of this as I don't want YouTube to age restrict my video. <laughs> He's really enjoying it though. But then Dracula comes in and spoils all the fun, forbidding the ladies from having their way with Jonathan and drinking his blood. In consolation he gives the ladies a baby, which properly horrifies Jonathan, and Dracula lets out this stereotypical evil laugh. <laughs> Back in England, Lucy has finally decided on a suitor. The eligible Arthur was her husband-to-be. So she and Mina are in the garden and it starts raining, to which the girls start laughing because that's the proper reaction of a Victorian lady when it comes to rain. But then there's an apparition in the sky. Dracula is watching them. And the two women start dancing about in the rain, kissing each other. Okay. <laughs> so the storm is picking up and a ship arrives in London. Just like in the book, the captain's log narrates how the crew members had disappeared one by one. All the while, Jack is at the asylum, taking morphine and thinking about Lucy. <laughs> because why not? <laughs> it has absolutely nothing to do with the scene. I have no idea why this is there. Then the werewolf form of Dracula runs all the way from the ship over to Lucy's house. Yes, he has a werewolf form and it is also in the book. Lucy then goes out into the garden in a kind of trance, 
with Mina following her, calling her name. But she lost Lucy in the hedge base, and when she finally found her, she was on a garden bench, fornicating with a werewolf. Mina was quite horrified, and understandably so. So Dracula is now in London and fully regenerated into a dashing younger self. He goes out, enjoying himself, and he runs into Mina. So he puts on the charm for her, introducing himself as Prince Vlad. It takes a little while, but he eventually wears her down and gets her attention. But she has her guard up, because of Jonathan. We can be married when I return. Dr. Jack then pays a visit to Lucy, as she hasn't been feeling well. She asks him to kiss her, so he does. <laughs> Just, okay, <laughs> she's engaged to Arthur, but oh, sure. But he can't understand what's wrong with her, so he calls for his mentor, Dr. Van Helsing. So he comes to see her and he and Dr. Jack walk into her room with her on the bed, moaning with one breast hanging out, not even noticing their presence. But they go on to do a blood transfusion and I'm still not quite sure she even knew they were there. She kept on moaning though, so I suppose she enjoyed it. So then Mina is on a date drinking absinthe with Prince Vlad aka Dracula. Because why not? <laughs> she feels drawn to him, as though she already knew him somehow. They are fated, you could say, as she is his long-lost wife reincarnated. Meanwhile in Transylvania, poor Jonathan has been slowly drained by the three vampire ladies in Dracula's castle. Since the gates are locked, he is now forced to try and climb out of the castle, possibly even falling to his death. But it all went surprisingly well. So he makes it out and finds his way to an old convent from where he could finally write to Mina, asking her to come to him. So she goes and she writes to her secret prince that she cannot see him anymore. He did not take it well. <laughs> Enraged, he goes over to Lucy's in his wolf form, knocking back all the gentlemen guarding her and finally draining her for good. So Lucy is now seemingly dead, poor thing. Not quite sure who the man in the turban is, but he seems very sad at Lucy's passing. Mina and Jonathan are swiftly married at the convent and are then back in London in no time. They are followed by Dracula, however, and Jonathan panics when he spots him in the crowd. It is a man himself. Yeah. Look, he's growing young. Anyway, <laughs> Van Helsing leads Dr. Jack, Arthur and Quincy to Lucy's crypt. But lo and behold, she's not there. So the men all hide in a corner and watch as the white figure of Lucy carried a crying child into the crypt. They intercept her, with Van Helsing forcing her into her coffin with his crucifix. He then instructs her fiancé, Arthur, to hammer the stake into her heart as he himself decapitates her. Too bloody for YouTube, I'm afraid. So now, Lucy is gone for real. Van Helsing then goes on to have dinner with Mina and Jonathan, updating them on what had happened to Lucy. He was rather graphic, though, and Jonathan did not appreciate that. Doctor! Please! So then, the hunt for Dracula begins. The gentlemen, Van Helsing, Dr. Jack, Arthur, Quincy, and now Jonathan, all go to the Abbey to destroy Dracula's special dirt that he sleeps in. Meanwhile, Mina is alone in Dr. Jack's apartment at the nearby asylum. So Dracula sneaks away as a green mist sliding into Mina's bed. She is more than happy to see him and they have an intimate moment. She wants to be turned into a vampire but he hesitates as that would condemn her in the same way that he is condemned. 
Eventually, though, he relents and allows Mina to drink his blood. So the turning of Mina has now begun. But the clock is ticking. Without his special dirt that the gentleman had destroyed, Dracula now has to travel back to his homeland to regain his strength. But Van Helsing, Jonathan and the rest of the gang are following his trail. At the end of the journey, they split up and Mina goes with Van Helsing by carriage. That night, the curse begins to take hold and she tries to seduce and attack him, but he defends himself with a sacred wafer. There's a race to get to the castle between the men driving the boxed up Dracula to his home and our gentleman trying to intercept and kill Dracula before the sun sets. Sometime during the fighting, Quincy gets injured and dies, just like in the book. But then the movie takes another direction. Dracula gets stabbed by a sword, but Mina intervenes. Outside the doors of the castle, she defends her prince, pointing a gun at her husband Jonathan. So he lets them go, and she takes Dracula to the chapel where he had first renounced God over 400 years earlier. There, she declared her love for him, and he asked her to give him peace. So she pushed the sword all the way through his heart, after which she <laughs> took it out again and cut his head off. That's true love right there. So Dracula finally dies and Mina is cured from his curse. And that's where the movie ends. So there are a few key differences between the book and the movie, of course. Mina being the reincarnation of Dracula's wife seems to be a common trope in Dracula fiction, but that was not the case at all in the original book. Nor was he killed by her as he met his end at the hands of the gentleman. But I still appreciate this movie's attempt to give Dracula more of a backstory and not just have him be this evil monster. He is sensitive and very much driven by his emotions, whether it be love or anger or grief. I know I've been making fun of this movie a lot in this video, but I want to make it clear that I don't think this is a bad movie in any way. Quite the contrary, actually. <laughs> it's 100% camp and pure 90s nostalgia in terms of filmmaking. It has some stunning set pieces and costumes and makeup, along with very dramatic performances. It feels a bit like a stage play at times, you know what I mean? I just love it for what it is. I honestly wouldn't change a thing, especially not Keanu Reeves. <laughs> Doctor! Please. But do let me know what you think in the comments below, as I always enjoy reading your thoughts and opinions. And don't forget to like the video and subscribe to the channel as it is really helpful with the algorithm. It helps my little channel to reach out to more viewers. Thank you so much for watching today and I hope to see you back next time.